The first problem is I can't pray five times a day. I can't do it. Now, I don't believe you. Whoever said I can't do it, I don't believe you. You know why? Uh, because I believe Allah. And now I didn't say I believe in Allah. I said I believe Allah. There's a difference, right? I believe in Allah means I believe Allah exists. I believe in Him. But when I say I believe Allah, it means I believe what He says. He says, subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah does not burden anyone except unless they are able to carry that burden. This is what Allah said. Allah said He does not burden anyone with any responsibility unless they are capable of living up to that burden. This is what He said. You're saying you're not able to live up to a responsibility that Allah gave you. Isn't that true? You're saying I can't pray five times. It's too much. And Allah is saying yes you can. So I have a choice between believing you and believing Allah. And perhaps if you didn't realize this, maybe you're lying to yourself. Maybe you've convinced yourself because of your laziness, because of your lack of will, that you don't want to pray five times. Maybe you have to, I, I can't judge you. I don't know what the problem is. But the problem, maybe you're ashamed to pray in front of non-Muslims. You know, when I used to work in New York City, I would see Muslims praying all over the place. In the middle of Fifth Avenue, on the curb, the guy is making salah because it's time. Or you know, at the, in, the, in, the, in the university, you open the copy machine room, in the library, and there's like three guys praying right there, making salah. Muslims will pray. If there's time, we're going to pray. That's it. We're going to pray. So there are no excuses. So that's the first thing. Allah said you can. If, so if Allah gave this burden upon you, and He did in fact, then you can. Convince yourself of that. And, and rely on Allah, He'll make it easy for you. The second question is, does He really care? Does He even care if I pray or not? Now this question is actually more about, does He need my prayer or not? You're forgetting that the prayer isn't for Allah. It's for you. If all the people in the world, all they did with their life was pray to Allah, it would not make him any richer. Any, his, it wouldn't add to his kingdom because he already owns all of kingdom. And if no one mentioned Allah ever again, it doesn't diminish his dominion, his kingdom, his glory in any way. He doesn't need us. We need him. We need him. So the question is, do you feel like you need to pray? Do you feel like that's a need in your life? And if it's not, if you feel you're free of you know, begging Allah for his help, turning to Allah and submitting before His commandments, then that's a serious problem with your faith. It's become weak and this question only came up because you've been distanced from Allah for so long that shaitan can come to you and say, yeah, I know you used to feel bad about not praying. Let's just get rid of that bad feeling and replace it with, well, why do I have to pray anyway? That's the next phase of that disease. The first part was at least it was diagnosed, but at least you had some bad feeling. Guilt was still there. That's a gift from Allah. When that guilt even goes away and you say, ah, Allah doesn't need my prayer, it's all good. Why do I, so long as I'm doing good. And that's the last part I want to talk about, this so long as I'm doing good part. Who defines what's good? There, there are two kinds of good in this world. Please remember this, okay? There are two kinds of good. There's ethical good. I'm good to my neighbor. I'm honest at work. I'm nice to people. I don't steal. I don't cheat. You know, I'm, these are ethics, basic ethics, right? That everybody, I, I tell the truth, I'm honest, I pay my taxes, blah, blah, blah. These are ethical truths, okay? And I'm honest in business. Then there are religious goods. I go to Hajj, I give zakat, I pray five times a day, I fast in the month of Ramadan. These aren't ethical realities. These are religious goods. Good deeds that are religious and good deeds that are ethical, moral in nature. What happens a lot of times with Muslims and with non-Muslims, especially it happens with Muslims, is that we make a distinction between these two things. So in the Muslim world, you will find people that are morally good. They're nice to their family, they take care of their kids, they're responsible in the household, they're nice to their neighbors, they're honest at work, good people. But guess what? No religion. I don't need religion to be good, is what they say. And on the other extreme, you have people that pray, go to Hajj, give zakah, have a long beard, dress in a very religious garment, and yet, terrible to their family, cheating people in business, highly immoral and unethical. So what's happened is we have separated the two dimensions of goodness. Moral goodness, ethical goodness, and religious goodness. What Allah does in the Quran is, fuses them together in the ayah, this one ayah, it's called Ayatul Birr, the ayah of goodness. What does it mean to be good? 
if you study that ayah, it is a combination of two things. It's a combination of ethical principles, like fulfilling your promises, being patient, perseverant, you know, and also religious goodness, establishing the prayer, giving the zakah, right? So it's, it's a combination of both of those things in one place. So if you think you are in a position to define what good is, most likely you're sticking to moral goodness. And you're undermining religious goodness, like the rituals that Allah taught us. But what Allah wants is for us to have both at the same time. This is when a person is truly good. Otherwise, you're not really good. You, are, you have defined goodness for yourself and you have rejected Allah's definition of it. But we turn to Allah for guidance because we can't define things for ourselves. We want Him to define them for us. Turn to Allah, read your five salah a day. A Muslim and he does not read five salah? Allahu Akbar! How can that be, my brothers and sisters? If you have read one in the past and now you are reading two, it's a very big improvement. But that is not still the ideal. You need to continue because as Muslimin, we have khamsa salawatin fi kulli yawmin wa layla. If you look at the hadith of Mu'adh ibn Jabal, radiallahu anhu, when he was sent to Yemen, he was told to teach the people several items from amongst them. One of them was tell them they owe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala five daily prayers, not two, not three. You know, we word it differently. When we speak to the younger people, Sometimes we tell them, you know, you need a key to enter. For example, let's say paradise. You want to enter paradise, you need a key. You want to enter this door, you need a key. Each key has a number of teeth. Just like if I want to phone you, I need your phone number. Brother, if I have one error in the whole phone number, I won't get through to you. You see? So if I would like paradise, I need to read five salah on a daily basis. That is the figure. That's the number of teeth on the key. If you have one tooth missing, what happens? Try it. Take your key and break out one tooth. Put it in. It won't open your door. But there are so many other teeth. One is missing. My brothers and sisters, against your laziness or mine, against the coziness of your bed, against whatever you are doing in the mall or at your workplace or enjoying with your family, stop everything at the time of salah and quickly fulfill your salah imagine i am saying quickly whereas by right it's not supposed to be done quickly but even if you have done it in the midst of your work and you have fulfilled that salah come what may wallahi that may just be the means of your entry into paradise some of us are not submitters you know we follow islam where it where it is easy for us only well, we need to do better than that. Which means, where it is easy, Alhamdulillah. Where it is difficult, we still want to try and we still want to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The other day, I got a beautiful message on my phone. I need to share it with you. See, the, the question is, you think you are powerful. If you think you're very strong, you, you can lift. Lift your blanket for Salatul Fajr. Then you will be strong. Allah. In Surah Sajda, Allah says, speaks about these powerful believers and Allah says they are the ones whose sides refuse to actually lay down on those beds they move themselves off the bed the beddings in order to stand up in prayer for the Almighty at night praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fearing him and having hope in his mercy may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant that to us what if you're in a place like work or in school where you're forbade from praying on time and you're not allowed to pray on time? How do you reconcile that? You see, <clears throat> the reality is that I have to speak the truth. You see, the problem with that is, is that we've un misunderstood who Allah is. How many of you want to know how to answer that problem? Because if you go to work to pay your bills, guess what your reward for that work is? Paying those bills. That's your reward. In the hereafter, there might not be nothing for you because you did it for the wrong reasons. Anything we do in this life is supposed to be only to worship Allah. No matter what it is. Even if my job is to clean the sewers of Oslo, I should do it knowing that I'm doing it to please Allah. Work is worship according to the Prophet, peace be upon him. Therefore, if I'm doing a work that interferes with that worship, then that work is no longer viable for a Muslim. That's the reality of the matter. That when it's time to pray, you pray. Allah has created this earth as a masjid according to Ar-Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And there are only a few places you can't pray. And let me tell you, you don't work in any of them. 
You pray when it's time to pray. There's no one that can stop you from that. Because you have to understand that Allah is Rabb. That money that comes to you is not from your boss. It is not from your job. It is not from anything other than Allah Azza wa Jal has legislated that money to be placed in your hands. And if you are getting that money by disobeying Him, I am afraid of what is waiting for you in the next life. That if you place something before Allah, that thing has become your Rabb. We need to understand that, that look, I don't care what you have going on right now. I need five minutes to pray. This so-and-so fulan and this jack-off can go outside and smoke for 20 minutes and you're telling me I can't pray for five? We need to wake up and realize that we have rights. I don't care what the law says, I have a human right to worship how I want to worship. As long as that worship is not evil in and of itself. And I don't know how prayer has ever hurt anyone. So these things we have to understand, we have to stand up for them. Because let me tell you something about this world. Freedom isn't free as they say, but they say it for the wrong reason. Your rights, you have to fight for them. That's the way the world has always existed. We stand up for our rights and our dignities. You will respect me. If you don't like it, then do what you wish. If you fire me because of that, guess what? I have Allah who is Rabb. I have an Allah who is Rabb who will replace what I left for His sake with something better. That is the yaqeen, the certainty that the Muslims have to have. If not, then we're going to continue to be muddled in this mud of degradation and humiliation forever. We have to wake up to this.